Um, I actually asked for a little extra time at the beginning so I could make an announcement, and it turns out that I have two. Um, so this is, for, for those who don't know or have never been there, this is the reading room of the Letter Form Archive. Um, but uh, we have some kind of exciting news. This is our new stacks. Um, this is in uh, another unit in the same building. We had to get another unit because of what's happening, as you will soon understand. Um, and uh, what you're looking at is 600 linear feet of shelving in one dense storage space, which is actually uh, more than the entire existing archive. Um, this is what arrived on Monday. Um, and really the worst part of this whole thing, it's like Christmas, I'm missing Christmas morning because I got to, I got to see the, the boxes broken out of the crates and I got to, to open a few sample boxes, but I missed the unpacking. It's still going on, they won't be done. So here's a clue, um, if, if there's really anyone who still doesn't know about this. Um, <laughs> So, you all probably know these books, uh, the Tosh and Set uh, History of Type and Typography. And um, they, these books have about 300 pieces. Um, and it's a nice presentation. I mean, they give each piece two or three spreads, so they go into a little bit of depth. But um, I will tell you in a minute how many there actually were in the collection. Uh, this was in April when Stephen came uh, to help me appraise and, and organize and get ready for making a bid. Um, and this is this week during the unpacking. Uh, it also happens to introduce you to our new executive director and Kate, who's been with us for a year now. Um, and in the background, you can see some of, some of the unpacked collection. So the first day, Tuesday, um, I was gone, and uh, but Jim Parkinson, as soon as he found out about this, he said, "Okay, I want to volunteer to be there the day that, you know, the first day that the boxes are open." So Jim and Kate, on um, on Tuesday, unpacked 25 boxes of type specimens before 1850. So this is the Tolinar collection. That's Jan Tolinar in front of it. And there's a summary of what's in it. Um, it's one of the largest uh, aggregations of type specimens that's ever been brought together in private hands. Um, obviously, there are institutions that have deep holdings, but um, this is a pretty good addition to the letter form archive. Now, I've always wanted to do this. So actually, I thought there was going to be one announcement, but. We, we, we have a, a, new, a new thing, a new deal that was just done in the last week, and it is this. So, thank you. Uh, the details are there. So the extended program will start in January. It's um, pretty much a clone of the New York program in terms of curriculum. With one significant change, as Sumner has been working on the syllabus, uh, as he goes through the historical stuff, whenever there's a reference or something that he's showing in slides or whatever that we have in the archive, the actual object will be brought and shown. So his syllabus now, it's the, pretty much the same as New York, except that in each sort of subsection, there's a list of objects. Um, that will be shared with the students. Um, and it, similarly to New York, there's a lecture series, there will be public workshops. We're starting this fall with that stuff to kind of ramp up. The deadline for portfolio submissions is November 16th, and the extended program will start in January. It's one year, it's all evenings and weekends, so it it's works for people who have a job. And um, and special thanks to Monotype. Uh, they have given us a very nice grant, which is going to fully outfit the new classroom. So the new unit 
will house the Tolinar collection and the Type at Cooper classroom. Um, and we're calling it the Type Annex. And here's a preview of the web page, which should be live now. Um, we don't have all the details. Some of the instructors are confirmed, Jim Parkinson, Sumner, of course, uh, Jessica Hish. We'll probably have some of the same folks that uh, teach in New York, like John Downer and, and Ken Barber, on a kind of a rotation. Um, and also other Bay Area folks that, that uh, have good things to say. So um, that's the end of my announcements. Uh, let's move on to the actual presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Ernst Schneidler was one of the greatest teachers, certainly of the 20th century, maybe ever, based on uh, the work of his students. And he was one of those teachers that um, didn't create clones of himself, but rather pushed people to experiment and develop their own styles. And so the, the work is, is really diverse. Um, so this is um, a shelf of the stuff in the archive that this presentation is drawn from. Um, on the left is Schneidler's own stuff. The, the four volume um, portfolio set is called Der Wasserman. And that's kind of Schneidler's masterwork. Uh, it's an extraordinary piece of, of business, and um, it's quite rare. Uh, nobody knows exactly how many copies there are, but it was produced over a span of almost 20 years by Schneidler with the help of his students in the workshop of the Stuttgart School. Uh, and then the rest of what's on the shelf are um, examples of things by his students. So uh, Walter Brudy, Georg Trump, uh, Imre Reiner, was probably the most prolific author of his students. There's about 10 books in the middle there by Imre Reiner. Um, Rudolf Speyman, Copper, and it goes on. Um, this is some of the type ephemera that's included in the presentation. Uh, basically the, the uh, specimen booklets for typefaces designed by Schneidler and his students. Um, so this is um, kind of prehistory. This is uh, a piece by one of Schneidler's teachers. Uh, this is by Peter Behrens. It was done in 1900. It's a very early use of uh, a grotesque for text. Uh, actually, here you're seeing the title page, but the book is set in, uh, in sans serif throughout. And uh, Behrens was an influential architect and also one of the first people to do corporate identity for the AEG company, which is kind of the German equivalent of our GE, big conglomerate, lots of divisions. And he uh, created the first uh, complete corporate identity. So he was one of Schneidler's students, uh, sorry, teachers. The other one was Fritz Helmuth Emke. Uh, and this is an example of his work um, from the early part of the century. Uh, MK was a lettering artist, also a type designer, uh, and Behrens actually did some type design as well. Okay, so here is an overview. And uh, so the blue lines are, are his two teachers. The black, of course, is Schneidler. The dark gray are his direct students, and the light gray are students of his students. Um, and this is it's kind of random that this stuff is in the archive. I mean, I've, I've loved this guy's work for a long time and been interested in, in his work and the work of his students in a kind of a general way. But um, there was no sort of conscious effort to collect this range of stuff. And when I started to discover that we had um, I, some of these things we had and I didn't even know that they were students or students of students, uh, figured that out through the research. Um, and it's a pretty interesting bunch. The, the, the ones that are best known in this world are obviously the type designers and calligraphers and, and book designers. Uh, but a lot of his students became printmakers or book artists or 
in one case, uh, one of the most famous children's book illustrators. Um, so here is an early piece of Schneidler's work. Um, this was book design and illustration from 1913. And I'm trying to see how sharp it is. Um, not his fully formed style and very decorative, which a number of his early book illustration uh, commissions were. Okay, this is from Der Wasserman, and this begins a series of slides from Der Wasserman. Um, it's, can you read it? Is it legible? Because it's a really good piece of text. It's actually the only sort of instructional text in Der Wasserman in English. Um, and in fact, as far as I know, there's no German version of it, so it's kind of strange. It's definitely an outlier because most of the of the content is, is in German. And um, so I'm not gonna read it, but I encourage you to read it. The slides that follow um, are a perfect example of what he's talking about. It's a one eight-page gathering from Der Wasserman, which contains 24 iterations on essentially business card design. And um, the, the, you know, the elements of variation that you see at the bottom, shape, size, degree of movement, direction of movement, de degree of contrast, manner of interlocking, are all demonstrated here. Now, I'm pretty sure you can't read this, but I'm not sure that really matters. Uh, the text is the same. It's basically a business name and address, the kind of stuff that would be on a business card or a, 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 maybe a letterhead. Um, but 24 iterations of how you might arrange it. So this is typical of Schneidler's um, work and also his pedagogy. He, he encouraged a lot of iteration and experimentation and you see this as a recurring theme in, in his work and in the work of his students. So there's the end of that. Now we're continuing in Der Wasserman. This is from the first of the four portfolios, uh, which is basically um, typesetting and book design. Um, and these are various um, examples from that, from that first portfolio. Um, this is one of maybe three or four slides coming up that is basically a complex book spread. You've got shoulder verse numbering, you've got shoulder notes, you've got lots of stuff going on. These are complex bits of design, but exquisite control over texture and, uh, and emphasis, and um, just beautiful spreads. Another one. I think this is this is uh, Bible text. Here's another one. This one with the with the red and the blue and the black reminds me of of uh, some of the mid-century stuff from the '60s. Um, it's really kind of ahead of its time, I think. Um, and the extra leading is a textural device, something that that. Uh, a lot of people used in, in mid-century modern design, and um, Zoff also was, was fond of that device. Um, this is from the second portfolio, which is uh, Schrift and Schreiben, and basically uh, calligraphy and, and lettering. And um, there's most of the work in Der Wasserman is Schneidler's, but some individual pieces have been identified as students' work. So this one on the left is actually by Rudolf Speyman, and we know that because it was reproduced later in one of his books. Um, but for the most part, this is Schneidler's own work. Here's an exemplar of a, a sort of a humanist slash rotunda, um, and it gives you a sense of the calligraphic skill in evidence here. Um, all of Schneidler's students had to learn um, 
basically everything. They all had to learn how to, how to set type. They all had to learn calligraphy. They all had to learn how to draw. And they were required to do illustration projects, even if they were essentially on a typography track, and calligraphy if they were an illustrator. And it's basically kind of a foundational program of graphic arts. Um, these are something that, that Schneidler um, coined the term schriftblatt, which is basically kind of uh, um, text, I don't know. Somebody who speaks German can help me. It's, it's, it's basically a sort of word picture in a way. And they're quite abstract. He did a number of them, and his students also did them. Um, often they're iterations of the same thing, like a monogram or a brief bit of text um, repeated as here. This is a fun one. This is um, just basically a calligraphic exemplar, but such a beautiful spread. And then this is from, I actually skipped the third portfolio, which is um, variations on the theme of Horace. It's, it's, the whole portfolio is um, variant layouts of um, an edition of, of Horace, uh, title pages and, and spreads and so forth. Um, there's a lot more to see here, so I skipped that volume. It's really wonderful, but it's also kind of about um, minor variation. So now we're in the fourth portfolio, which is illustration and abstracts. And the thing on the left is poster. Um, this is where you see some ad work, um, which was also part of the curriculum, combining illustration and, and typography. This is a really interesting uh, thing. This is basically a sort of figure ground study uh, with circular form, and it precedes this, which is playing with some of the same ideas for a mark. Uh, these are illustrations from um, uh, one of his earlier illustrated books, not the same one that I showed at the beginning, but. Um, a quite similar one from the same period. And some more ad design. So Der Wassermann was started uh, in, the, in the late 20s or early 30s. And in the mid 30s, the uh, existing sheets were packed away. Um, he didn't consider it complete. Um, and I think because of what was going on in, in Germany, um, maybe he felt it was wise to, to just kind of take it out of circulation. It was eventually released after the war uh, as four portfolios. He'd originally intended it to be um, five. Here's some abstract studies from that, that last portfolio. This is a really fun piece. This is a, actually an offering from um, a German periodical, um, the Archiv de, de Bückewerb, and it's all about the Stuttgart School. Um, this is the, um, the opening spread with the title page, and uh, this happens to be the only piece in the archive that, that belonged to Schneidler. It has his book plate. Um, notice the 1927, which I think is pretty fabulous. And then this is what's in it. And this, there's a section at the beginning of this, there's about two spreads of German text, which uh, I need to get translated, but it's pretty clear from the structure of it that it's kind of a pedagogical overview of the program. So um, I'm really looking forward to finding out what that says. The work itself is um, kind of typical of what's in Der Wassum and maybe extends it a little. Um, and it's, it's also credited to the individual um, artists. So uh, it's kind of cool because a lot of this is student work and uh, you, you know there's a list in the back so you can tell exactly what Schneidler's and what's, uh, what's student. This is not um, well known. It's um, apparently quite rare.
Again, you see iteration on a mark. Okay, and this is the first of the type specimens of Schneidler faces. This was done uh, for Shelter and Gaiseki in, um, I think about 1920, maybe 1919, 1920. By this time, he had just gotten the job teaching at Stuttgart. He taught there from, um, from around 1919 for 30 years until 1949 or so when he retired. And um, this face isn't well known. It's really a kind of an interesting thing. It's sort of a, a it's kind of a sans serif, um, but it's, it's not monoline and it has a few kind of medi medieval alternate forms. Um, but it prefigures things like Lydian, uh, but then also Pascal and Optima a little bit. Um, and again, this is 1919. This is another of Schneidler's faces. This was for the Weber type foundry in Stuttgart, 1920s. Um, it's a really interesting face. It's a beautiful, uh, bold display face and a quirky italic. And this is probably his most famous face, it, which has many names. It's now known probably mainly as Stempel Schneidler. Um, in Germany, it was released as Schneidler Medieval. In um, UK and US, it was released as Bauer Text. Um, and it's a beautiful face. This is Legend, which was very popular for a while, um, especially in sort of suggesting, um, you know, what would probably in those days be called Oriental flavor, but um, it's a little bit reminiscent of Hebrew or Arabic in the in the uh, in the edge pen forms, and so it was used for that kind of uh, advertising quite a lot. Um, this is a monograph on Schneidler that was done about 10 years ago in Germany. Um, it was a small edition and um, didn't get very wide distribution, unfortunately. It's very good um, and has um, a lot of his working drawings for types and a lot of types that were never released. So these are two faces. These were actually released. Um, Contrast and Graphique. Um, this one I think is Uniparous, and it was cut by Bauer but never released until this monograph. Okay, so now we're moving on to the students. This is um, probably, well, in a way, his best known student. It certainly, Brudy took over. Uh, after Schneidler retired um, at, St at the Stuttgart School and taught for another 20, 25 years. So he sort of carried on the tradition. He also did some typeface design, and uh, but he was probably mainly known as a teacher. This is a book that he did, uh, which is about 60 or 80 pages. And the entire thing is is this um, EGB monograph. It's, it's uh, 60 or 80 pages of variations on one set of three letters. Uh, this is actually from a portfolio that Brudy did with, with his students in the 50s that's in the same format as Der Wasserman, but it's, it's um, smaller. It's one portfolio, and it's not even as big as, as uh, the smallest of the Der Wasserman portfolios, but it's a similar idea. It's Brudy's work as, as well as his students' work and kind of shows the range of what was going on um, carrying on the Schneidler tradition into the 50s and 60s. Oops. These are all from that portfolio. Uh, this is one of Brudy's typefaces called Pan Script. 
and then probably his best known face is Rudy Medieval, which um, not many people know anymore, but um, uh, Bertolt did well with it in the 50s. Now this is, was a kind of a recent discovery. Um, so this is the first of a student, first work of a student of a student. This is, Werner Pfeiffer was uh, a student of Brudy. Um, after going to the Stuttgart School, he landed in New York uh, in the late 50s. And he worked in advertising, but what he ended up doing mainly was teaching at Pratt and um, developing a kind of a book art practice, which continues to this day. He's exhibited as recently as a couple of years ago, and he's still active. Um, this book is quite remarkable. It's um, it, the, the title Liber Mobile suggests that there's something active about it. Uh, basically, it's a series of folded sheets with um, circular and semicircular die cuts and layers of essentially collaged type um, which you can set up, you can kind of stand it on a table and interleave um, the sections, or you can, you know, what's on the left is actually, uh, I think, the first view of it, which is through a die-cut circle down through maybe two or three layers. Um, and it just kind of goes on and on, and you can, you can recombine it endlessly. And I, I think this is a really good example of, you know, Schneidler's influence once removed, right? This is not something Schneidler would have done, but it's clearly somebody who learned about letter forms and printing and space and uh, figure ground and all the things that came out of the Stuttgart School and Schneidler's teaching. So this is a monograph about Georg Trump, the, the German type designer. Um, also a Schneidler student. Uh, this spread basically, you can't see the detail, but this is sort of a summary of his, his oeuvre. Um, and uh, the city is, was his first typeface. It was from the 30s for Berthold, and it was quite modernist. And the specimen is really cool. Um, we didn't have it when I was doing this presentation, but we do now. Um, and um, it's, it prefigures... Um, some of his later work, but it's also kind of of the modernist moment. I, I like this better. I think it's more distinctive than, than Memphis and Rockwell and, and Beaton, some of the others that came out around the same time. Uh, this is also from the monograph, um, showing some of his work with marks and graphic design. Once again, iteration. See it everywhere. And then this is um, uh, a book catalog and a, a photo of Trump looking at, um, I think, a proof of Jaguar. And here are some of uh, the first specimens of, of Trump's faces. So this is TimeScript. Most of these are 50s and 60s. And um, except for City, which was Berthold, I think almost all of his faces are, are for Weber, which was a, a Stuttgart foundry. Um, This is kind of a unique thing. Um, it, it echoes some of the, the work that you'd see in, in Der Wasserman, but it's definitely a branching development. Uh, it's really sort of a, a, a monoline script in a way, but it has a very calligraphic feel while being extremely legible and, and having a modern uh, character because of the monoline. Codex which was his homage to um, uh, Roman capitals, the imperial letter, with his own flavor. That's the thing. I'm, I'm just actually realizing now, I don't think any of Schneidler's work or any of Schneidler's students' work uh, in type design could be called a revival. There was always a twist. There was always something original. Uh, Delphin is a kind of an interesting thing. It, it goes back to the first italics 
uh, in that it's uh, an italic lowercase with a Roman uppercase. Um, and of course, you know, when Arrighi and, and Grifo and so on cut the first italics, they didn't bother cutting punctuation and capitals, and so they were used with, with Roman capitals. And it's a pretty cool look. So this was Trump's homage to that, but um, couldn't be more different from Arrighi, obviously. This is Jaguar script. And then Trump Medieval, which is probably his best known face um, and was really popular in the 60s and 70s for, for corporate work, for you know, art monographs. It was, it, was, um, it was one of Carl Zahn's favorite faces. Um, and um, too bad about the comb binding. It's, it's kind of a cool, I mean, it's, it's actually a beautifully designed specimen, but why would they combine it? This is the same period when um, Stempel started doing perfect bound uh, ephemeral specimens that were, it's, it's almost like padding compound. You look at it and it falls apart. I don't know what they were thinking. Some of it is that by now, um, even though they were producing the fonts in metal, um, the specimens were sometimes printed by offset. I think parts of this uh, were printed by offset. Um, okay, moving on to Imre Reiner. This is a, a little book, a little oblong book about yay big of initial letters. And um, it's got three or four uh, versions of each letter of the alphabet in some kind of context. Uh, this is from another book by Inray Reiner called Alphabets. Um, by the way, his, in fact, this was co-offered with his wife, Hedwig, um, whose maiden name was Bauer, and, and was, uh, she was a Schneidler student as well. So they, they worked together on, on a number of things. Uh, she shares the credit with him on this book. That's from the Alphabet book, and I think maybe from the monogram. Book. There's, a, there's a book of monograms as well. Uh, this one is called Lettering and Book Art, and um, it's pretty much what it is. And now some of the Reiner types. So this is Reiner Black, Stradivarius, and Reiner Script. These were for. Um, uh, Bauer and, and Amsterdam. Here's the inside of that, of the uh, script one. And then probably his best known face is Corvinus. Um, these pieces are examples from a, um, a portfolio specimen. It's basically a kind of a folder that has a booklet specimen in the front and then a bunch of loose pieces of examples in use. Um, so these are actually, you know, the size. They're, this this is one shot. So, um, uh, moving on to Rudolf Speyman, uh, who was mainly a calligrapher. Um, he did one typeface, um, but he did a lot of calligraphic book jackets, book titling, and in this case, entire books. Uh, this is a, a little series of. Um, sort of religious uh, texts that were entirely hand-lettered. These are two little chapbooks about Rudolf Speyman's work and some examples from inside them. And this is his one typeface, which is called Gavot for Klingspor in I think late 30s. Moving on to Albert Copper. Copper was, um, uh, you know, he's a student of Schneidler. He, he um, not sure where he was from originally, but you know. It's, he went to school in Stuttgart, obviously. 
But he landed in, in Leipzig after the war. Uh, and it was, in fact, by choice. He was a communist. Um, but he was a great book artist and teacher. And um, Leipzig has had a long tradition of excellence in, in book design. And um, the Leipzig Book Fair goes back like over 100 years. Uh, and even during the, the Cold War era, it was one of the bright spots behind the Iron Curtain in terms of book production and design and type generally. Uh, they had issues. There was only one foundry um, in East Germany, um, and they had limitations in terms of materials and so on, but they did really quite good work. Um, and he was a very influential teacher. So these are um, examples of, of his calligraphy from books. Actually, this one, the one on the left is a woodcut. One on the right is lettering. This is... Um, obviously the end papers of one of his books. Uh, and he was a pretty prolific author too. He, he wrote, um, oh, I don't know, six or eight books, including a really good biography of Gutenberg and um, a big instructional text on typography. So this, this woman, Hildegard Kerger, was um, a student of Copper and taught after he did, uh, or I think with him and then after, uh, at the Leipzig School. Uh, this has always been one of my favorite calligraphy books. It's, it was re recommended to me early on, and it's, it has a very typographic sensibility. Uh, it's not artsy-craftsy at all. It has wonderful basic instruction in figure ground relationships and the geometry of letters and so on. Um, but the best part of it is, is that Kirker's interpretations of of the classical scripts are very clean and modern. So whereas a lot of calligraphy books, especially American and British ones, take chancery cursive and make it look like it did in the Renaissance, uh, what Kruger did is, is to bring them into the 20th century. And it's a, it's a solid book of instruction in calligraphy, but it also has a very modern sensibility and uh, beautiful design. Okay, this is um, a monograph on the work of uh, Gert Wunderlich, who was another student of Copper and um, also taught at the Leipzig School. Um, his most famous typeface was called Maxima, which is kind of in the, the uh, Helvetica universe realm. It was the, the East German typo art version of, of uh, that style. It's actually beautifully done, and it has some unique characteristics. It, nobody knows it, because the typo art faces that were done in East Germany are virtually unknown now. Has it, does anybody know if any of that stuff has been revived? Yeah? OK. I like this face. It's quite good. Um, there's another one of his faces, um, and some of his book work. He did, he did a lot of different things uh, in his design practice, book design posters, uh, and he was also a very influential teacher. So this is a, a grouping of some of Wunderlich's um, book work, and um, again, I think you can see echoes of the Schneidler pedagogy, but in a completely, you know, obviously he's moved on, but the sensitivity to, to figure and ground, the flow of things, the relationship of, of letters, and the, I don't know, it just, it, it seems to me to echo that ped pedagogy. Uh, okay, this is actually the work of, I think this is the only one that we have in the collection, which is um, student of a student of a student. So this is the work of a woman named Sabine Golde, and she was a student of Kerger and Wunderlich. So that's once removed from Copper, once removed from Schneidler. So she's a student of, a student of two students of a student of Schneidler. And um, she's a graphic designer, but she's also a book artist. Um, this is an example of her book art, and it's, um, it's poems about clouds. It's, you can probably tell it's printed on, um, I don't know what the stuff is called, it's sort of like Tyvek. 
it's a it's a um, a long fiber um, substrate, but it's super super light. So this entire book weighs about an ounce, and it's also translucent, as you can see. These letters are individually rubber stamped for the entire edition, which you know she only does like ten or twenty of each, so I guess it's okay. And then there's some print, uh, you know, the full text is interspersed. This is another of her pieces. Um, can you see the white on white on the cover on the left? I don't know how clear that is. Um, so this is actually four views composited. The, the far left is the cover of the case. Uh, next is the open case. Then the, the piece as you take it out of the wrapper and one spread. And it's, it's hand cut through the cardstock essentially and folded and then with um, vinyl letters applied by hand, the, the white on white. And this is another, that's the entire piece. So, but it's reversible, so that's, it, it goes both ways. Uh, this is one of Schneidler's direct students, Hop Grieshaber. And he was primarily known as a, as a printmaker. Uh, he did a lot of book illustration. He wasn't very well known as a type uh, typographer or graphic designer, and he didn't do any typeface design. But he did this one book in, um, in the 50s called Poesia Typographica, and it's a beautiful thing. This is uh, letterpress, mostly wood type. And black overprint. So I'm, some of them, I, I've never actually tried to count the passes, but it's, it's all black and it's all uh, direct from letterpress. So in some cases, there's three or four passes. Okay, why is the very hungry caterpillar in a Schneidler presentation? Um, because Eric Carl was a student of Schneidler. Um, Eric had a really interesting trajectory. He um, was actually born in Germany his parents brought him to the U.S. before the war and back to Germany before the war. Think about that for a minute. So he was in Germany, in Stuttgart during the war, and he went to the Stuttgart school after the war um, and studied with Schneidler for four years. Um, this is um, the book up, about Eric Carle's work and a photograph of Schneidler from that period, so late 40s. Uh, during the time that, that Carl was studying with him. These are some examples of Eric's student work from the Stuttgart School. And this is the personal connection, because these are books that I published of Eric Carl's in the 80s, uh, when I had a publishing company. Um, and the only reason, you know, he had, he had published The Very Hungry Caterpillar in the 60s. And by the way, The Very Hungry Caterpillar is the best-selling children's picture book of all time. The last I heard, they were up over 40 million copies worldwide. It's, you know, children's books translate easily, so that has an effect, but um, it was just a remarkable, that was his first book, I mean. Um, but it's a, a perfect example of how he thinks and the concept um, all of his books have a unifying concept and a very strong um, idea behind them. And um, so, but the, the interesting thing is that he was published at the time by Putnam and Harper's and all the major publishers. Why would he agree to be published by my little picture book studio? Because I knew who Schneidler was. <laughs> we bonded over Schneidler. I helped find him a copy of Der Wasserman. And the other thing is that I promised to um, uh, print his books with more care and better quality than he was getting. And he was very sensitive to these things because he was a Schneidler student. He knew what good printing was. And what Putnam and Harper were giving him in the 80s was crap. So um, anyway, we, did, we published about 10 of his books. Um, this is a trade show sign that he did for us. And the collage is sort of typical Eric Carle. Um, 
And, and by the way, the technique that he uses is really kind of fun. He, he developed this pretty early on, and it's been um, a consistent uh, style through, through most of his children's illustration. What he does is he takes plain white tissue paper and then prepares it. Splatters, paints, you know, dry brush, everything you can think of to apply color to plain tissue paper. He creates these full sheets of patterns and colors, and he has flat files in his studio with like 40 drawers. Each, it, it's a spectrum flow, right? It's, it's, each is a color. And so when he, when he starts to do an illustration, he basically, you know, he'll sketch it out, and then he goes to the drawers, and he picks the colors, and cuts the tissues that he's made, and makes the collage. Um, so, you know, the PBS, those are kind of cool letter forms, but I want to point out that the Picture Book Studio is hand cut from black paper. This is a guy who knows letter forms. You don't see it in his work, generally, uh, but he was a Schneidler student. Thank you.